Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about the dienes and I'm going to be talking about different types of dienes where we can see conjugated, accumulated, isolated, and eventually I'm going to talk about the MO diagrams for these conjugated dienes and that's going to bring in along the nodes, the HOMO, which is the highest occupied molecular orbital, and the LUMO, which is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. It's really important to be able to identify those, and uh, and I'll kind of briefly mention what the difference is between the photochemical versus in thermal, how your LUMO and HOMO changes whenever you're running in a photochemical versus in a thermal reaction. So before we get down to those complicated stuff, I'll talk about the types of dienes. So we have the isolated dienes, where you will have two double bonds and obviously we're not really talking about only two double bonds when we're talking about these conjugated and isolated system you could have more than two pi bonds or more than two double bonds but here uh, for reference I'm just only looking at the uh, only looking at the dienes so here in, in case of first one I clearly see that okay I got this uh, first pi bond or the double bond and then they got the second one they're only separated by one sigma bond. So another way of saying that's going to be conjugated. Those two are going to be conjugated with one another. So this first one is going to be a conjugated diene. When I'm looking at this second one, I do have two pi bonds, so two double bonds here. But those two double bonds are separated by at least two sigma bonds. And uh, whenever they are separated by more than one sigma bond, they are not going to be conjugated anymore they're going to be isolated and i'll show you how the first one becoming conjugated with the help of uh, unhybridized p orbitals in a minute so this second one is going to be isolated diene and the third one sometimes you may see the double bonds on right next to one another whereas there's no separation no sigma bond separation and those are going to be your accumulated alkenes or accumulated dienes and these are also called allenes they're not very stable so you, that's why you don't really see them but that doesn't necessarily mean the two double bonds right next to one another does not exist they did do exist in a good example is carbon dioxide so carbon dioxide is an example of accumulated uh, diene uh, is just not with the carbons but rather it's with the oxygen all right now let's talk about these uh, conjugated dienes uh, uh, since they are going to be the most stable out of the other ones, and the reason is the, uh, the stabilization energy that's going to be coming from uh, these resonances, and uh, why that really works, let's talk about their molecular orbitals. So in a conjugated diene, and I'm taking an example of 1,3-beta diene here, every carbon here is going to be an sp2 hybridized, and that means there is going to be one unhybridized p orbital in every single carbon atom. So I'm just going to go ahead and write down p orbital that's going to stay unhybridized. And uh, if I call these four carbons and I have drawn those four carbons here, and these are going to be your unhybridized p orbitals, uh, p, uh, unhybridized p orbitals on those four carbons. Now. How are they going to be pairing up with one another when they are making the molecular orbitals? Uh, since you have four atomic orbitals, uh, the molecular orbital theory says if you're combining four atomic orbitals, you must get four molecular orbitals, and that's what we're really going to get. And usually they're going to have some sort of uh, shades on them, and I'll, I'll draw those in a minute. Or another way of saying they're going to have um, like uh, electron density regions where you have high electron density and where you have very low electron density in, in those particular regions. So let's suppose if I have these as my atomic orbitals, I'm going to have a little bit of space there. So when I combine those, there's a possibility I'm going to get all four of those aligned in a sense that their electron density regions are right next to one another. So I'm going to go ahead and draw these shading regions. They are pairing up with one another. So when they have these shading regions, you will have all these pairing up with one another. 
So when they are pairing up with one another, in this particular case, I'm going to have carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4. Even carbon 2 and 3 will have a partial double bond character because the orbitals are aligned so that their phases, uh, their orbitals are in phase here. So this is going to be your lowest molecular orbital. So we're going to call that psi 1. And then what's the other possibility? The other possibility would have been, okay, I'm just going to copy this down and put this down here. So I could have technically the first two aligned, but then the next two are going to be opposite to one another. So something like this. So now, as soon as you run into this scenario, you start creating a uh, destructive interference where you're going to have a node here. So you end up getting one node in this particular case. So that line wherever the phases of these orbitals are not really matching or they're kind of turning opposite to one another, you create a node there. So this is going to be creation of a node. And this is going to be your second molecular orbital in the line. So that's going to be called an SI2. Now in this particular case, this carbon 2 and carbon 3 does not have the double bond character. The double bond character in between the carbon 2 and 3 was only in the first molecular orbital set. So that's why these conjugated ions are so stable that that's because uh, you have a double bond character in, in between every single carbon-carbon bond um, based on this very first molecular orbital that we have drawn. Then what's the other possibility? So I can go ahead and take this one, copy this down here. So remember we had a total of four atomic orbitals, so we must get four molecular orbitals as well. So I can have a um, different possibility where I can start increasing these uh, numbers of nodes there. The other possibility is the first one is pointed up, the second one is pointed down, the third one is pointed down, and the fourth one is pointed up as well. So here I started seeing there is one flip right here and then there is another flip right there. So I'm getting two nodes now. There's two nodes here. And this is going to be called an SI3. And then eventually I will have the last one. So I'm going to put that down here. Then this last one, I want to draw that so that I'll have increased number of nodes from two. So the only possibility I can think of where I will have more nodes than two would be everything is flipped. So none of these orbitals are in constructive interference, but rather they're all going to be in destructive interference where they're all going to be creating the nodes there. So you have one node right there, you got another one right there, and you got another one right there. So you have a total of three nodes in this particular case, and we're going to call that psi 4. So obviously these were your atomic orbitals, and if you recall, atomic orbitals energy is going to be somewhere in the middle and then you start getting these uh, uh, molecular orbitals and then you know anti-bonding molecular orbitals as well and remember the bonding molecular orbitals they usually have lower energy than your atomic orbitals so that's why you have two of those drawn on the bottom or two of those drawn below the atomic orbitals line the psi 1 and the psi 2 and the psi 3 and psi 4 they have high energy than these atomic orbitals, so they could be considered as your, they're kind of similar to the anti-bonding molecular orbitals in that particular case. So if I go back and figure out, count how many pi electrons I have, so I'm not really worrying about the sigma electrons here, only the pi electrons because we are trying to figure out how the p orbitals are aligned when they create the molecular orbitals. So remember, there's two pi bonds that brings in a total of four electrons. So when I come down here, and if you recall, every molecular set, um, every molecular orbital set can hold a max of 
two electrons. So since I have four electrons coming in, I'll have two electrons in psi one, and I'll have two electrons in the psi two. And if I had another set of electron, then that will go on psi three and so on. But since I have only four electrons here, then I'll have in psi one and psi two. So based on this scenario, I can see the highest orbital set or the highest molecular orbital that's holding on to the electrons or that has the electron is actually your psi two. So that's gonna be your homo. So make sure you're able to identify what your HOMO is and what your LUMO is. So HOMO stands for highest occupied molecular orbital. And then the very first molecular orbital that does not have electrons is going to be your psi 3, and that's going to be called your LUMO. So LUMO is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So this is how you're going to be setting up all your orbitals in, in, in this particular order. And if you have, suppose, three double bonds conjugated, then you'll have six atomic orbitals. And in that case, they will give you a set of six molecular orbitals from psi one all the way to psi six. And then you arrange them just like this. You have zero nodes to first, uh, one node, two nodes, and you just kind of keep increasing and exploring the possibilities of those uh, um, atomic orbital so that you can have increased number of nodes. So based on that, you can draw all the way from psi 1 to psi 6, and you can have these homos and uh, these lumos assigned. So whenever you run so-called thermal reactions where the temperature, uh, where the reactions are being done under um, thermal conditions or high temperatures, then your whatever order I have right now, that's what it's gonna look like. Now, you will have psi two acting as an homo, and you'll have psi three acting as an alumo. But if you somehow try to run this, or if you decide to run this reaction under photochemical conditions, or another way of saying you um, expose the molecule in to the UV light first, or the light that it actually really needs to excite the electrons then you will not have the same homos and lumos anymore. And in that case, uh, that things changes slightly. So if I just kind of show you what's going to happen, I'm going to just copy this down here. So hopefully this, everything comes up. So duplicate that. I'm going to bring this down here so that you can actually see this better. So this was a thermal setup where we had this psi 2 being the homo and this psi 3 being the lumo. But if I'm running this under photochemical, so this is an, under thermal condition, but if I'm running this reaction with photochemical conditions, then one of the electrons from psi 2, so remember psi 1 and uh, psi 2 has two electrons each. So when you expose this under the UV light, then one of the electrons will get excited. So I'm gonna go ahead and show that right here. So one of this electron is gonna get excited to the excited state and the very first excited state is gonna be the psi three. So then you're set up Your setup would look something like this. Everything else stays the same. And then I will not have that one electron here anymore. I will not have this homo anymore. And then I'll have one electron in the psi 3 in that particular case, rather. So then your psi 3 becomes the very first molecular orbital that's carrying a very last molecular orbital that's going to be carrying the electron. So that's going to be your highest occupied molecular orbital. And then your psi 4 in that case becomes the lumen. That's going to be the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital in that case. So this is how you're going to be uh, looking at the differences between the photochemical and the thermal conditions. And uh, this will play an important role in terms of the stereochemistry when you do these uh, complicated pericyclic reactions. But uh, uh, knowing basic is always important.